here we are now. So now I'm actually the first elephant acupuncturist in the past 3,000 years. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome back to the podcast that's so in tune with nature that even our guest is wild this week, the Raw Safari Podcast. That's right, y'all. This week is a very special episode because I am bringing you my interview with Dr. Gabby Wild. Now, Dr. Gabby Wild is a name that you should know, and if you don't already know it, well, you're going to get to hear her for about an hour here, but um, beyond that, you should check out the cool work that she does. Uh, Dr. Wild is a Nat Geo vet, is a vet at WCS, has her own foundation and travels the world taking care of sick animals, is a certified, the only certified elephant acupuncturist in the world right now and for a long period of time. I I mean, her resume is incredible. Oh, and she's an author of this amazing book called How to Speak Animal. We are going to talk a lot about the different ways that animals communicate, how humans and animals can try to communicate with each other, and uh, also just a lot of the other cool stuff that uh, that Gabby does. I have to be honest with y'all, I could have made this episode multiple hours long. Gabby, however, is doing a book tour and, uh, you know, just would not have been able to do that. And it's a real bummer because uh, she does such amazing stuff. You can see her on the Nat Geo Kids show Animal Jam, and she's even an eco-fashionista. And if you don't know what that is, well, if you're a patron, you'll get to find out because after the interview, we got some bonus patron audio uh, that talks about that role in her life, and it's really interesting. So if you're interested in supporting the pod and getting to hear that kind of stuff, for as little as $3 a month, you can do so at patreon.com slash raw safari. And while we're talking about that kind of stuff, make sure you're hitting subscribe on this uh, podcast so that you don't miss an episode. Make sure that you're following along on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at raw safari, uh, at raw safari pod on TikTok. And uh, if you're liking what you hear, go rate and review the the show. I really appreciate it. It helps people find the show. So cool. Thank you for all of that. And uh, yeah, I don't I don't really have much else to say. Dr. Wild's incredible. She is very good at explaining things. And um, you're probably much more interested in hearing her than me. So without further ado, here is my interview with Dr. Gabby Wild, Nat Geo vet, WCS vet, and author of How to Speak Animal. So, hello. Why don't we start off by you telling me who you are? Hi, I am Dr. Gabby Wild. I'm a wildlife veterinarian, and I recently published this lovely Nat Geo Kids book about how to speak animal. Yes, and I'm I'm very excited about that. I have some red pandas that I need to know that I love them. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about how to get to that. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, but first, I would love to start with a little bit about your history and kind of who you are and and how you became a vet. And is it just because your last name is Wild, or you know, I'm just curious. <laughs> Absolutely, I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian when I was a child. And I made the official declaration apparently when I was four years old Mm. after I watched The Lion King. It was official. It was going to happen. And so ever since then, I've, in fact, probably even before then, I was always working with animals. Um, My crazy grandfather allowed me to have even a pigeon nursery. (laughs) So we had a little place if we had injured pigeons and the local vet thought I was nuts and helped me with them. So it was, it was always a, a passion, always a love. And um, from there, I just, you know, continued to love science and really be in, investigated and, and really 
into it, which goes to show with people, just because you love animals doesn't mean you have to be a vet. There's so many ways to show you love animals and so many ways to, to do animals. But for me, being a wildlife vet was the way. And um, I proceeded to, um, to, to continue in that route. And I worked with elephants when I was 16. I don't know if all of this is too much in depth oh, for you. No, no, we want depth. Depth is very we good on depth. this podcast. Oh, so, yeah, no. Elephants okay. at 16 is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I started working with elephants then and then continued to um, go to school to, at Cornell. And um, I was involved with all of their wildlife work there. And then I went to veterinary school at Cornell and then continued my training and to becoming a, a wildlife veterinarian as well. And then I um, moved to New York and I've been working with um, the WCS, Wildlife Conservation Society. A lot of them think of them as the Bronx Zoo, but it's really so much more than that. And, um, and so now I also, when I was in veterinary school, I started my own foundation for threatened animals and what I provide now are international veterinary services complementary. And I also, I obviously do some work in the, the United States as well, but there's so much international work that's needed. And um, it's pretty expensive to, for an elephant to cover his or her, her bill. So we try to we try to make that happen for them, for different NGOs, rescues, national parks, to, to offer that support for them. And um and, and that brings us to me working with Animal Jam for National Geographic. And this is my second book now with Nat Geo. And I'm thrilled and honored to, to work with them. And here we are today. And that is just amazing. All of that is just like, that's just such a cool journey. And the fact that you started a foundation in vet school, my fiance uh, just became a vet. Um, she's in her second year of practice now. Uh, she went Wonderful. to vet school at um, Penn. And I can tell you that starting a foundation was not on any of those students' minds because they were all thinking, holy crap, how do I get through vet school? <laughs> I can't <laughs> believe that you were able to do that simultaneously. That is that is fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you how did you work with elephants at 16? Um, I just like the Nike commercial. I just did it. <laughs> um, really, really. My my mother helped me get there and um i started working with the king's stable and the first thing is you got to learn behavior and you've got to learn from the ground up and so that's where we we started was just learning how to interact with these elephants that were if you will owned by mahouts these are not usually wild elephants i do work with wild elephants and at that time was learning as well how to work with wild asian elephants um, so we started with the mahouts and how to train them. And then little by little, as I kept returning and returning and was in vet school and was actually then becoming a real vet, my, my training changed from basic behavior and, and tending to them and caring for them to being their doctor. Well, that's amazing. How much do you think that behavior plays into your ability to be a good vet as far as studying behavior and understanding it, um, all that stuff. It's essential. It's the first step. The first thing before I touch an animal is I, I visually see it. What's it doing? What's it acting like? Because um, that tells me, how sick are you? What, what is the issue? Are you lame? What, what's going on? So I have to be able to understand its behavior in order to better assess what is abnormal. And if I don't have an understanding, so let's say, for example, I wanted to, I don't know, examine a peacock. And I have no idea that peacocks don't really fly. And I say, oh, this poor bird, its wings are broken. Well, <laughs> that's, that's a, a bit idiotic. So I shouldn't be doing that job because I don't understand how this creature works. And there's several other birds that, that don't fly, like cockapoo parrots, for example, the turkeys, you know. So it's really important to, to learn what an animal is like. Um, liar birds, you know, I can keep going on and on with different birds. So you, you have to understand their behavior in order to understand how to treat them. 
That makes sense. And, you know, I, I've always kind of had this understanding that behavior is so important to vet med specifically because it's hard to communicate with animals. For, for a normal human who's listening to this podcast, you go to the doctor and the doctor says, what's wrong? And you say, my tummy hurts. And they say, scale of one to 10, how much? And you say eight. And they say, OK, uh, what does this do? What does that do? And you can't really do that, but you're now, um, with this latest book, kind of focused on animal communication a little bit. Um, have you found that that helps your practice at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. By understanding how they speak with one another, and then maybe heterospecific communication, how they speak between different species, depending on the situation, allows me to better understand how to take care of them. Well, that's awesome. And so, yeah, let's let's talk about this animal communication thing a little bit. Um, so you you wrote this book and it's a um, it's a book for young readers. But also, I mean, as an adult, I found it to be quite fascinating and I thought there were a lot of interesting things in it. Um, what was like, why did you decide that, you know, maybe younger readers in particular would want to understand how to speak animal? So we'll start with this first Thing, and then I'll answer your question so it makes more sense. Great. I started this career for the animals and it evolved through my work to work with National Geographic and then through that evolved to work with kids through National Geographic. And I have come to realize children are utterly fascinated with animals and it makes sense. So later on, I'm like, aha, that makes sense because if you look at cartoons, you look at toys, kids love for the most part, not all children, they love to relate to the world through animals. And it's amazing when I see this with children. So when I started my first book with National Geographic, which was Dr. Gabby Wild, Wild Vet Adventures, it was intended for children. And then as they asked me, hey, this was going really nicely. Do you, do you want to do another book? And we said, there's a whole series of how to speak something. But how to speak animal really relates to what I do because I do all different types of animals. And children want to know about animals. Children are engaged. They care. They find it fun. They love to know cool facts, but especially about animals. So it was really fun for me to, to tailor this to an audience that is technically between like 8 to 12 years old, but certainly younger kids can, can engage in it. And most certainly older kids like us can engage in it <laughs> and, and certainly learn things that you had no idea. And, and that's the goal is to have somebody be able to open up any page of the book. You don't have to read it from cover to cover and be able to say, oh, wow, I just opened this page and I learned something random about rhinos. I learned something random about ladybugs, about bees, about mosquitoes. And it's just something interesting. So you can say to yourself, this is just really cool facts. And if anything, it gives you a greater appreciation about animals. And I think for children to learn about animal communication, we're instilling within them a respect. We, we need to change our perspective. And I feel like our world is really evolving in a, in a really cool way about perspectives and mutual understandings. And for animals, becoming to respect them in a in a way where they're not used as props. So if you kind of look at the 17, 1800s and before that, where hunting was the thing and that hunting was before a thing of we need to survive. Then it was a sport for the wealthy to put trophies together. And then it was a machismo thing. And then it's evolved to using them as props because people think they're cool and they can be pets. Um, and then manhandling them on TV shows and, and using them in that kind of fashion. And now we're evolving to an era where we realize as cute as it is, a cute baby tiger cub, they're not meant to be in photos. They're not meant to be your, your little prop to, to make money, to, to use them that way. The same way we wouldn't want a tiger taking your baby and taking photos with your baby. Most people don't even want a photo of your baby when you're holding your baby with its face covered, you know? So, so it's just kind of developing this respect and learning. They have a world of their own and they communicate on their own. And we're trying to learn that way of communication 
not simply because we want to eavesdrop, but we want to figure out who they are, and what they do, so we can actually be kind to them and respect them. And if we can, even help them, because there's so much damage we've done to the wild that we're trying to fix it. And that we have this aspect of the book, so it's divided by in the air, on the land, in the water, and by our side. And the by our side is so kids can also relate to animals that they probably deal with on a daily basis from if you're from a farm, we've got the farm animals. Um, if you have a dog or a cat or a fish, you, you have those kinds of animals related in there, bunnies. So we, we put those kinds of more pocket pets and stuff into the book so that way kids can relate to their friends in the house. Because a dog is actually quite like a wolf, but not like a wolf. So a wolf is going to attack you and bite you. But a lot of the behavior that we see of dogs with dogs and how dogs interact um, can cue us to how wolves might interact. Say with kitty cats, they have a lot of similar behaviors, but at the same time, we have to respect that they are definitely different species. And um, respecting that we might want to pet our dog, but certainly if you saw a wolf or a coyote in your backyard, you don't want to do the same. And it's this understanding for children that we want them to be excited, but learn. That makes a lot of sense. And and I agree. Um, I do have a question, though. Why do you think that so many adults, and like you said, there are those who, who like to remain childlike, like us, and, and curious and love animals. But um, why do you think so many adults lose that spark? And is there anything that we can do to help foster it? All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. I love what you said. It's a question I contemplated so much. Um, I would say that, in general, I think we reach a point where kids either feel like it's not as cool and there are different interests that develop, whether it's techie or whatever it might be. Um, I don't know if maybe we we see tending to animals and caring about animals is looked at as potentially a weakness in our society, where you have to show strength in other ways. Um, I'm not entirely certain of it, but what I can tell you is that to foster it, We just have to be very supportive of animals and we have to be in an environment where we continue to respect nature and respect, um, respect animals. Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's great. I love that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so in this book, you talk about the, the four different ways that animals communicate, auditory, visual, um, tactile and chemical. And, um, I'd love to go through kind of, uh, you know, a quick explanation of those um, for my listeners, uh, if if you don't mind. Absolutely. So we talk about auditory. That's, you hear the birds chirping. They're clearly communicating something, whether it's to another mate or to the flock, they're communicating. So that's one thing. Um, Then we can discuss um, the visual. So I'm sure you guys have heard about our birds have extraordinary dances especially like birds of paradise that have these absolutely gorgeous dances that they do in order to get a mate um and and that's a form of visual communication there are other types of visual communication that are are very obvious to us like if i smile at you that's a, a sign that, you know, I like you. It was nice what you said versus if a, uh, a crocodile smiles at you, you better be running the other direction because <laughs> that is not a smile. But, but it is a form of visual communication. And when we talk about um, t- 
tactile, my, my favorite form of communication that's tactile is with elephants. So they use their trunks to touch each other and to usually in a nice way to touch, but they also use it to smack, don't get me wrong. Um, but they, they also use it, especially because it's a matriarchal society, mummies with their babies. And just the way we hold hand in hand, they hold trunk in trunk. And they also, the babies hold the tail of the mummy when they're walking. So they use it as a form of, of, of tactility for knowing their presence and for affection, if you will. I, I don't like for some of the scientists to, to kind of use those words because it's a bit anthropomorphic. But if you will, I think we can relate to that word a bit in understanding what they're doing. Um, and then, of course, with other types of communication with chemical. When we refer to chemical, one could be scent. So yes, it's a smell that's, uh, that is um, accepted by the olfactory bulb versus it's, um, it's a pheromone. So for example, we see that a lot of animals have scent glands and they can release these pheromones through the, the different scent glands that then they're able to detect. Um, a big famous one that, that a lot of horse lovers know is about the Fleeman response. When you see a horse lifting up its lip, it's trying to really absorb those pheromones that are being released and usually to let, let them know that someone's in heat, but not always. There are other different types of pheromones. And even people have them. We just haven't developed them as much as some species have. Um, and you know, for example, when snakes are quote unquote smelling, they're sticking out their tongue to, to better expose their, uh, their organ to allow us to, or allow them, I should say not us, and not us, but to allow them using, um, using the Jacobson's organ to better sense the smell. And um, it has these sensors at the roof of the mouth and that's Jacobson's organ that I'm talking about and it picks up on these different scents. So those kinds of chemicals. And that's also the same thing that, um, you know, if you have a pet dog or you ever see one and it's, it's sniffing another dog or it's constantly stopping on a walk to sniff the ground, that is what that dog is doing, correct? Exactly. And so many animals use pee, actually dung, um, which we'll, I guess we'll talk about a little bit later, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> um, that they use these, these cues to either mark the territory or to say, hi, I'm over here. So like, for example... Um, the, the three toad sloth is known to stay up in the tree for eight days and then go down to the bathroom. Sometimes they can sometimes go to the bathroom sooner than eight days. But when a female is trying to let a mate know that she is around, she comes down to the ground and usually pees and is trying to let somebody know, hi, I'm, I'm here and ready to mate. And that, that's a lot of work for a sloth, but <laughs> she does it. So different ways in which they'll, they'll communicate to each other. That's really cool. I have a really, really dumb question about chemical. I doubt it's dumb. <laughs> it's kind of dumb. Okay, so I understand that, um, you know, we, we all, and, you know, people and animals, I mean, people are animals, um, have have pheromones and have, have chemicals in our urine. And I know that, like, say, an animal like a dog or sloth, any of these animals that use that, can get a lot of understanding and um, kind of get a picture of another one of their own species. Like, a dog can sniff a dog's urine and understand all kinds of stuff about that dog. Can, can, does that go across species? If I pee outside and a dog smells it, can they like understand a little bit about me or is it species specific? Interesting. You should say that dogs have so many more receptors and I'm not certain if there have been pee tests, but I'm, I don't doubt that somebody has studied this, but I do know that there are certain types of, um, tests, mainly like breath tests that they've been able to use to actually detect different diseases. So interestingly enough, yes, dogs can detect certain things like that. And I'm sure that they can use it for marking people and knowing different people. Well, that's awesome because I love peeing outside. And now if I ever get in trouble, I can just tell a cop, no, I'm just trying to communicate with the dog. So I appreciate that info. <laughs> But all joking aside, I do think that's really cool. It's actually so strange to think about how you could do something like that and actually be giving information to the um, animals around you. That's fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And I think animal communication has only helped us better understand 
Maybe there's more that we should be studying about ourselves and more so about our world. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon, how did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Forrest Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. Absolutely. Um, And, you know, you talk a lot in this book about how animals communicate with each other. And there are so many really cool examples in here. Um, But then you you also, you touch a little bit about on on the concept of animal and human communication. Um, And I think, you know, from reading through here, that basically what you're telling me is that I'm probably never going to be able to look at my favorite red panda and say, I love you in red panda ease. But um, (laughs) what kind of stuff can we do to improve uh, human animal communication? Well, um, it depends on the species. And just observing that species and getting to know how do they seem to be communicating with each other? will better give us an idea of how we can better communicate to them and make them feel more comfortable if they even want that. So with wild animals, they want nothing to do with us, generally speaking. Um, There are animals that have become habituated to people and in that process, they've come to, if you will, tolerate us. But naturally, evolutionarily speaking, they've evolved to stay away from us for, for their own safety. But for, for animals that, like dogs and cats, you know, and other domestic animals, you, you just learn their behavior and you respect their behavior. So you might find that some cats do not want to be held. They want to be left absolutely alone because they have their own personalities. And they will come on your lap when they want to come on your lap. And there's nothing you can do about it or they'll scratch your eyes out. <laughs> Whereas some cats want to be cradled like a baby. Um, I've seen the same thing with certain dogs. Some dogs don't want to be on their back. It makes them feel very uncomfortable. They want to feel that their forelegs are on the ground. So each animal itself has its own personality. And then when working with wild animals, I find the same thing. I can work with one elephant and we can have, you know, if you will, hit it off. (laughs) Um, Whereas another, I'll be working with it and it just wants to kill me. And this can be in a zoo setting, for example, similar to to your your red pandas that are in like a zoo setting, that they just really don't want anything to do with you. Now, red pandas tend to be a lot more playful than um, than some of these other animals, but it's just learning their behavior and respecting how they want to be spoken to. If you will, it's like a culture. You don't go to certain cultures wearing bikinis because that's insulting to them. if you get my drift, you know, so you have to understand their, their way in which they want to speak to you. No, that actually makes a lot of sense. And I wish more people would, um, you know, do that with other humans too. Like we could apply everything that you just said to online conversations and make the world a better place just by respecting how people want to communicate and, and, you know, meeting them where they are instead of forcing our own thing on them, which I think we see a lot of people do with animals too. We've all seen the person exactly. who runs up to a, you know, a dog and is like, I'm going to pet you. And the dog is like, please don't. And the person just doesn't exactly. pay attention. So yeah, I think that's a really good, uh, good thing that everyone can take from this, this book and this conversation. Absolutely. It's all about respect. And speaking of the whole dog thing, some dogs don't like other people, don't like other dogs. And you're putting yourself in harm's way and you're putting that dog with way too high stress levels. So just going up to that owner and saying, hey, may I pet your dog? Is just the the polite thing to do for the owner because no one wants like an awkward situation where you're just petting their their pet and they're like, "Um, that person might not want people to touch their animal. It's, It's their animal, you know? So it's just, it's all about respect. And this whole world, once you can learn respect, we can learn so much more and unfortunately, the issues that we are facing with wildlife all stem from a lack of respect for nature and all lack for, stem from a lack of respect for other people. Because if we come to realize that 
one part of the world affects the other part of the world. Just take, for example, lack of grain production in Ukraine led to areas being in starvation. So we, we have to be able to respect other places and realize we're all unified and we're all tied together. Absolutely, we do. I love that. I love um, I love that answer. I love how serious that was. And, and now I'm going to, yet again, ruin the seriousness by asking you, um, is it your official uh, scientific opinion that the song uh, The Fox, What Does the Fox Say, should be significantly longer because the fox has so many different ways to communicate? Yes, it should be much longer. <laughs> <laughs> it should be much longer. It's a cute song, though. It is. I like it a lot. But um, yeah, foxes and, and canids in general have like a tons of different or a tons. Yes. Tons of different ways of communicating. Um, I, I actually it's kind of funny when uh, when I first moved to the area that I live in, um, there are a lot of red foxes there and they communicate loudly as as they do. They, they do the scream thing a lot. <laughs> and um, the first time I heard it. So uh, the place that I live is directly across from a park. And the first time I heard it, I legitimately thought that a, a young woman was being raped or murdered in the park. Oh my and God. I oh my God. it was like one o'clock in the morning and I ran outside my house. I like was throwing clothes on and ran outside ready to rescue this person. And I saw a fox. Luckily, I saw the fox. It was right there screaming and it blew my mind. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's amazing, though. And that that's a way of understanding the communication. So now you'll you'll approach, but you'll be cautious. You, you, you don't know which species you're dealing with now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Or was it or was it a liar bird doing mimicry? Who knows? <laughs> it's just it's just fascinating. I feel like how how much we're all surrounded by animals in nature and yet how little people take the time to to understand them, you know? Absolutely. Um, and that goes Absolutely. to one of the other things I love in this book is you don't just talk uh, about like, um, oh, I always forget this word, uh, the really cool species that everybody likes. What is the name? Help me out here. Ooh. Oh. Pandas? No, no, no. Like um, the, like for overall, they're like the, the funky species, the cool species, the... Uh, charismatic species. That's it. Charismatic. I'm so sorry. We no, I'll, I'll sorry. edit all of that out. What is the species everybody likes? I'm thinking, what species is the favorite species? Panda was a really good answer, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but so you don't just talk about charismatic species, but you also talk about other things. Like you have a, a section on ants. And Ooh, I don't yeah. think most people even really think about ant communication ever. They just squish them when they're in their house. But can you talk about how complex and how cool ant communication is? Oh, absolutely complex. So we were talking earlier about chemicals. And I think talking about chemicals with ants is exactly where you want to be. Because I'm sure many people look at them and they say, hmm, how are they making such an incredible um Q. They're all following one right after the other absolutely perfectly. And it's because they release pheromones. And then they release these little pheromones and they're able to walk along that, that exact, that exact um, Q just so perfectly. And it's, it's really quite amazing how they're able to send these messages so they can let them know. And, and they'll be in this perfect line of chemicals that their antennae are picking up. So the, the biggest form of communication between them is um, chemical. They do have visual cues where they do, you know, go from one to the other and they're handing their, their leaves, if you will, depending on the species, handing leaves to one another. So that's another form of communication that we didn't really go into in the book because we really wanted to emphasize how cool it is that they have this type of chemical communication. Um, they, they actually have in their poison gland these chemicals that they use for, for long distances. And then they also have short distance chemicals, so different types of chemicals, yeah, different wow. types of pheromones that they use what's called um, a type of stridulation, where it's like this, um, and this is not a chemical, this is just for short additions, but the stridulation that they actually have these vibrations that they provide, and that allows the, um, the other workers to know where some of the leaves are located. And they'll lift the, it's called a gas, so they'll lift up their, their gaster this part of their abdomen that um that when they find it and it helps make these vibrations even more pronounced and they can they can use even that visual cue 
if you will, it's like this little booty shake <laughs> to say, here we are. This is what the, the leaves are. So they're really, really incredible. And can, I mean, if they don't communicate with each other, how could you have so many ants in one area? I mean, they have to communicate in order to function and create their unbelievable um, homes. That is so cool. I did not realize that um, ants twerk to communicate. That's that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, there's no way. As they say, teamwork makes the dream work. And if there's going to be thousands, if not millions of them, in fact, there are some that had billions. Um, there was one in, um, in Europe, the largest one that had billions of ants in, in the ant hive. And it's... There's no other way for them to function if they're not communicating with each other. And I'm sure there's so much we have yet to study about ants. Yeah, that's really cool. And so mm -hmm. um, with this being a you know conservation podcast in general, but often very focused on zoo-specific stuff, um, do you think that um, – you know, learning more about communication is particularly uh, helpful for zookeepers? Oh, absolutely. It's essential for everything we do. Um, we're able, similar to how you learn how your dog is doing, a zookeeper is like my best friend in a zoo setting because they know the collection animals they're working with so well. If they miss that meal or they didn't eat the full meal, they're the first ones to notice. They're the first ones to notice a strange behavior. And they're their advocate more than, than the veterinarian. So it's essential to understand that animal's natural behavior and then even each individual's behavior. And um, we have used a lot of positive reinforcement in the zoo settings in order to train an animal to communicate with us. So, for example, if we know an animal is not going back in the wild, it's essential that they habituate to us and get to know who we are in a polite distanced fashion in most cases unless we need to do our examinations because often they're living longer in zoo settings so we don't want to sedate or desensitize an animal any more than we really need to so let's suppose we need to do a brief examination on a tiger we teach that tiger in most zoos how to come close to the fence and lift up their paws and they get a treat for doing so and we're able to do just like a brief assessment just a quick glance. Of course, we're not right next to them. We're separated by fencing, but it allows us to, to do some basic stuff. If we have to do things that require touching, not only for our safety and the team's safety, but we anesthetize them for their safety because we don't want to be stressing them out during these situations. And um, it's essential to know their behavior so that way we know how they're doing, how they're feeling. And um, providing in zoo settings Enrichment. Enrichment is part of behavior, um, part of their, their ways of communication. They might need to feel like they're attacking prey. They might need to get those smells that they, they used to smell in the wild. And if we don't understand their behavior and the things that they like, then we're doing them a disservice by housing them in our zoo palace, if you will. <laughs> they're our guests. That. Yes. No, I like that. Yeah. That's a great way to put that. That's really, uh, that's awesome. Uh, do you end up doing a lot of vet work um, specifically at the WCS facilities? Um, my role is in the global health department. So monitoring global issues and conservation issues out in the wild, not necessarily working on the collection animals. Gotcha. Okay. I, I knew that that was your main role. I just wasn't sure if you ever, you know, happen to do both. I, I just thought I'd ask. Um, Surgical procedures if needed. Okay. It's my specialty. Cool. That's, that's so cool. And with the global health situation, I know that there's a big push for one health right now where we understand oh, that, yes. you know, human and, and animal, we all coexist. We're all one health. Um, are you doing anything with the one health initiative and, uh, how do you feel about <laughs> all of that? That is what I do. Absolutely. That is what I do in writing papers, promoting different agendas and um, a lot of political work with it. Absolutely. And public health. So I have a master's in public health as well. So integrating animal health with environmental health and human health is precisely what we're constantly doing and working on. Um, and so I do feel very strongly about it because it is one world. 
Absolutely it is. We, we've seen how COVID, you know, showed us that this is a, a potentially zoonotic disease and it did transfer from different animals. But when I say potentially zoonotic, meaning we don't really yet know the origin of it, um, but it has the zoonotic potential because we've seen it go from the people to different animals. And, um, you know, over 70 percent of emerging diseases are zoonotic so we have to always understand that we have we have these situations where we need to be protecting animals and the separation between us and we can prevent additional emerging diseases to happen well since you're studying all of this um what are your thoughts on monkeypox and and is this going to be the next covid or, or what's going on with all of that oh boy um that remains to be seen um, I don't think it's going to be transmissible quite the same way because the, the transmissibility of, um, of viruses that are through the air, for example, respiratory, are quite different than these contact um, situations. But there are many ways in which it's able to be transmitted. So I think we need to be very forthcoming with how it's transmitted and um, what to be looking for. I think our greatest issue right now in our country from a lot of people is this mistrust of what people are telling them. And mistrust and misinformation is the kiss of death in public health. So what we really truly need is a very clear statement about what is going on and what to do to prevent it and not have wishy-washy um, statements about what people think something is and what people think or how people think it may be transmitted. I think that's what led to a lot of issues for um, COVID and frustrations about COVID. Yes, absolutely. I am a, I am a huge uh, advocate for, you know, uh, the death of misinformation. And um, even just with, with my podcast, my goal is largely to shine a light on the good work done uh, by zoos and, and, you know, conservation organizations and, and obviously talking about accredited zoos and all of that, because there's so much misinformation out there in the um, anti-captivity world. And it's now just always on TikTok and such. And there's, there's just so much bad stuff out there that I'm, I'm trying to combat that uh, whenever possible. It's, it's, it drives me crazy on a daily basis. I I've watched people in my own life who are intelligent, good people um, just become weird conspiracy theorists and believe stuff that I would have never believed of them in the political realm. And especially, like you said, about covid um, just because there's stuff out there and it's it's so heartbreaking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's it's important to get information correctly. And, you know, for example, we know that monkeypox is spread through skin to skin, close contact, bodily fluids. And I don't think people are doing a good enough job of explaining what that really means. And, um, you know, they've, they've been noticing that a lot of the locations in which monkeypox is located are in places that are in sexual organs, meaning that's a big place of contact. So I think we need to be doing better studies to say, is this being transmitted more frequently in populations that are sexually active? And if so, how so and why? They've seen it in children. Is it because parents had it? How is it being transmitted in these ways so people can learn how to prevent it? Obviously, they did say there's respiratory secretions as well, but in what capacity? How contagious is it? What's the, the closeness? What's the context? So people need to know we know the answers or they need to know outright. We do not know. I think when people feign to know information and then real information gets released, it discredits anything you're about to say that can actually be very helpful. And um, everything is about, as you just mentioned, being clear about messages and um, being, being direct and being honest and being open to listening to the messages as long as they are being delivered correctly. 
Absolutely. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's just a whole other form of animal communication <laughs> that we need to work on. Um, Precisely. <laughs> and I feel that if we talk about animals being a little bit more direct in humans, we have so many more nuances to how we say things and how we deliver things because we use our very complex language. And no animal has a complex language like the way in which humans speak. And um, it makes their form of getting the point across, perhaps in many ways, for most species, quite direct. They don't like it, you're going to get bitten. You're going to get eaten (laughs) and it's done with. And they have specific commands. You don't usually, at least from what we've studied, we don't usually see miscommunication. It's not a, oh, there's a hawk. Let's let's go out and have a party. It's let's there's a hawk. Let's run. <laughs> <laughs> right, absolutely. So just so I understand exactly what you're saying here, you're advocating for us to start biting people that give misinformation, correct? <laughs> oh well, not with monkey pox around. No, I'm oh, not. Fair, fair. Okay. <laughs> I kid, I kid, of course. But um, yes, yeah. No, that's uh, that's really interesting. So we're coming to the end of our time here. Um, but there was one other thing that I wanted to touch on before we get to our last story. Uh, which is your foundation. I always try to give a shout out in every uh, episode to a conservation organization. So can you talk about the the Gabby Wild Foundation and how people can find it and help and what exactly you're out there doing? You mentioned it a little at the beginning, but, you know, let people know again. Absolutely. So the Gabby Wild Foundation provides complementary veterinary services internationally, and we also have conservation projects. And... Um, You can learn more at GabbyWild.org, G-A-B-B-Y-W-I-L-D. And then you can get in touch with us through social media by following us, seeing our different events that we have going on. And it's just dr.gabbywild. And uh, then you can find us on Instagram, Facebook. I'm going to open a TikTok because everybody speaks the rave of it and it's all the rage. So I'll I'll work on getting that for people too. Um, And then of course we have a YouTube so people can watch videos and we're going to be making more videos, especially geared towards children because I've just had so many kids be so interested in what we're doing. And so the best way is through Instagram and, and Facebook. Okay, very cool. And one of those veterinary services that you provide is acupuncture, correct? That is correct. How is that a thing? How did you decide to to make that a thing? And, and what kind of effects do you see from that? So I made it a thing because I said to myself, self, if this has been going on for thousands of years and so many people have utilized it, Yes, of course, you can say it's a placebo effect, perhaps. But before you make that decision, even though we need a little bit more evidence for certain maladies that people portray them to heal, why don't we see what it does for pain? And um, because I was doing a lot of genetics research on orthopedic pain, um, specifically in dogs, and I was very frustrated by the lack of um, assistance we could provide because there's only so much we can do for orthopedic pain. So in veterinary school, I attended a lecture about it. I was sold when I saw in real time the improvements that I saw within literally five minutes of a horse being given um, just one single uh, pressure point with one single needle. And I was blown away. So I went and got certified myself in vet school. And here we are now. So now I'm actually the first elephant acupuncturist in the past 3,000 years. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I have you. much respect for that. Um, I've actually thought of trying acupuncture recently. And um, uh, hearing you talk about it makes me uh, way more interested since I, I respect and love what you do. So that's very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show, but there's one tale left to go, you're gonna laugh and say, oh no, it's time for the Ron Safari Poop Story. Hit me. Hit you. So I suppose when you're a vet, you can assess the rectum in a a variety of ways. You might not be able to stick your finger into a gerbil, so that one's out of the, out of the, you know. 
definitely not going to happen. For a kitten, you might, you know, put your pinky. For a dog, you might get an index finger. When you're doing cows, you go up to the elbow. For elephants, you're going up to the shoulder. And, and sometimes even you can go up to the shoulder for cows too when you're doing your pregnancy checks. And um, I had been doing a lot of this with the elephants up to the elbow and I'm like the, up to the shoulder. I'm like, wow, this is, this is, and I have to get on a ladder, by the way. So it's <laughs> on a ladder up to the shoulder. So we do a lot of this. And then I realized this is absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. If I really want to get a temperature, I'm just going to take a fresh dung ball and just stick the thermometer probe right there and be done with it. So that's now my, the way I, I rectal and just get that, get the temperature this way. <laughs> I think you've gotten a lot smarter over time. That makes a lot of sense. And efficient. <laughs> I like it. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you so much for having me. You ask such wonderful questions. Oh, thank you. Y'all, doesn't it just feel good to know that there's a person like Dr. Gabby Wild out there in the world educating children and, you know, childlike adults and um, helping animals in the wild and, and working from her office on the One Health stuff. And I just, ah, it, it makes my heart happy to know that someone like Gabby exists. And um, yeah, it was so great to spend this time uh, with her. And uh, maybe we'll be able to get her back on to talk about the show or more about elephant acupuncture or more about her stories in the wild. I feel like I could do an entire month on on Gabby. So uh, yeah, grateful that I was able to, to share her with y'all today. Now, if you would like to find out more about uh, what Gabby is up to, uh, as she mentioned, you can go to www.gabbywild.org and that's where you can find out about her foundation and such and on Instagram and Facebook she is Dr. Gabby Wild that's G A B B Y and um yeah I'll tell you what it, it's all a really good follow she's really interesting really cool posts a lot of neat stuff and um what can I say? I am officially a fan. This was this was a lot of fun. I hope y'all enjoyed it as well. And uh, we'll see you back here on Friday for our weekly Zoo News episode. Uh, and I guess the last thing I have to say is thank you to my Red Panda level patron, Laura Shank. I know you're going to love that bonus content from this episode. And remember, friends, the word credits backwards is Steiderk. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Vesley Gross. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.